Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining our Data Assured webinar, Five Steps to Stay Secure While Working From Home. I'm Jake Blackston, and I'm the Digital Solutions Manager here at the Delaware SBDC. Today, we have partnered with Anchor Security, who is a local cybersecurity firm, as well as our local SBA representative. Anchor will be covering some of our helpful tips and tricks to stay safe while at home. At the end of Anchor's presentation, the SBA will chime in with uh, some current scams that they are seeing and how, as a business owner, you can avoid falling victim to them. So without further ado, I will turn the mic over to Connor and the Anchor Security team to kick off our webinar. Hey guys, uh, thank you Jake for that introduction and uh, thank you for having us here. Uh, we're always happy to uh, help out the local community, always happy to help you guys out, the Delaware SBDC out. Uh, so thank you uh, really for having us here. Uh, so the title of today's presentation is Five Ways to Stay Secure While Working From Home. Um, with this uh, coronavirus, I call it the coronacation, uh, staying at home. Uh, with all this going on, um, you're probably working from home. Uh, and with that comes unfamiliar risks that you may or may not be aware of. And so I've created this uh, webinar where we'll teach you five things that you can do today if you wanted that will keep you more secure uh, so that nothing uh, bad starts happening. You may be hearing all the stuff happening with Zoom uh, or some other uh, security issues happening with individuals. So we're going to teach you how to avoid certain activities uh, and then also how to protect yourself uh, while you're working from home. These are the five topics that we will be uh, teaching you. Um, first is password protecting your Wi-Fi. Uh, enabling multi-factor authentication is the second. Uh, the third is updating your software. We'll get into how to do that a little bit later. The fourth is uh, staying alert for SMS and voice phishing. Um, over the last two weeks, that has really increased in popularity. So we'll go over uh, exactly how to recognize that uh, and how to uh, defend against it. And the fifth is staying up to date on your email phishing protection. Email phishing is still probably the biggest threat to large organizations, small organizations, individuals. Anyone with an email address um, is, is a potential uh, attack target for these people. So we'll go over how to protect yourself there as well. So password protecting your Wi-Fi. Why does it matter if I have a password on my Wi-Fi? A lot of people think, you know, I'm in my home. I'm on my Wi-Fi on my computer. I'm the only one on it. My neighbors don't care. They're not accessing it. Why, did, why does it matter that I have a password? Well, actually, it is a huge uh, weakness, a huge security flaw if you don't have a password in your Wi-Fi. So unprotected Wi-Fi, that is Wi-Fi without a password, allows anyone to connect to your network that can see it. So if someone was driving outside of your house uh, and had a laptop open or had their phone on and wanted to connect to your Wi-Fi, they'd have the ability to do that. The second, so, so that, that in itself is not an enormous issue, but what that means uh, is what provides a security flaw. Home networks are, are just generically more trusted. You trust it more, your devices also trust it more. So typically, I mean, if you've ever set up a new printer or you've ever set up a new um, laptop or desktop or whatever, uh, on your home network, a little pop-up will come up in the bottom right-hand side of your screen and it'll say, hey, would you like uh, to let your other devices on this network discover you and in return you get to discover them and you know it's your home network you're like of course of course i'll let uh, it'll be easy i'll set up my printer in one click and it'll be connected i'll start printing today because trust me i even have trouble setting up printers it sucks a lot of the time so sometimes you just click that button but that means uh, now that you've allowed it to be discoverable if someone gains access to your home network they will be able to find your devices so if they're on your Wi-Fi network and they can find your devices, then they can um, over time see your traffic, uh, which is what leads to, to common um, security breaches. They'll be able to have your passwords. They'll have all of your traffic so they can, uh, what's called packet sniffing. Uh, they can get your, um, they can get all the information, all your logins over time, essentially. Uh, so that's why you need to protect your Wi-Fi to not let anyone inside of that protected network. So that brings me to the next question. Well, then how can I do this? Uh, the first step is that if you're looking at your uh, wireless router, whether it's Verizon, Comcast, Google, um, there are a hundred different providers of Wi-Fi routers. On the back, there will be instructions. Um, typically, there will be a default account um, that they'll have. Honestly, most of the time, the 
username is admin and the password is admin. So if that's the case, change it um, because a lot of people could crack it um, if, if they were to attempt to get access to your Wi-Fi. Uh, and then on the back of your router, there'll be instructions. Typically it'll say, hey, go to this website, simple three-step process, you'll have your Wi-Fi set up and running. Uh, the second uh, that we recommend, the second step we recommend is to set up multiple Wi-Fi connections. Now you can do this many ways. Um, typically it'll also be uh, in the instructions or you'll see uh, an option once you log into your router. Uh, we recommend that there be a private and a um, guest network. Um, a lot of my uh, friends do this now. Um, we do this now where when you go over someone's house, instead of connecting to their trusted network, you connect to a different level of network. And that does two things. If your guest network, um, if the password for that gets out and your guest network is compromised, then your home network is still not, still good. It's not compromised. Uh, and also, everybody hates having slow internet. So you can actually set the amount of bandwidth, it's called, on the guest network. And if your guests have an issue with their cell phone, well, that's that's really bad. Sorry about that. But if you have, like, it's so more annoying if, if you end up having bandwidth issues on your Wi-Fi. So you can control that if there are a lot of people over your house or if your kids are home or, or what have you, or you have a million devices on there by putting them on a guest network. Uh, and then if possible, don't allow the network discovery. So I'm guilty of allowing network discovery just in the essence of saving a headache when setting up a printer. Um, but if possible, don't allow it uh, just so that if there is an issue, if someone does get access to your um, to your home Wi-Fi, that they are not allowed to uh, discover maybe you have a work device there or they're not discovering your personal devices, which would be a, uh, a, a big uh, security flaw. Uh, the second thing you can do is enable multi-factor authentication. So this is a three-step process. If you've never heard of it, it's a really simple process. You log in, so right there it's a login screen. You type in your username, your password, and then there's some external verification source. So you see three sources right there. One is a text message that'll get sent to you. One is uh, using your fingerprint, and the other is a key fob that generates a code or that you, you plug into your computer. With those two sources of confirmation, you are able to uh, verify that the person logging in is the person they say they are, and then you get access. So that's really request plus verification gives you access. That's, that's the three-step process. And let's go over a couple different types of multi-factor authentication. So the first is fingerprint. Uh, if you have an iPhone or even some Android devices, you probably have um, your fingerprint set up to open your cell phone. That is a form of uh, authentication right there. So if you try to download an iPhone app, not only do you have to enter your password in, your, your passcode, but you also have to put your fingerprint in. That is an example of uh, two-factor authentication which is uh, a form of multi-factor authentication. Uh, the second uh, form that we see very often is a key fob. A lot of banks um, opt to use this, where if you contact your bank, they'll give you a key fob. The benefit of a key fob, it is unhackable. However, if you lose your key fob, it is a, it's supposed to be, it's a very hard process to get that undone um, because it's supposed to be secure and you're supposed to have your key fob all the time. So if you get a key fob, you're very secure, but just make sure you're not losing it. Keep it in one place, uh, your sock drawer, uh, maybe your desk at home, what have you, just don't lose that key fob because it is super uh, important that you always have it. Uh, the third and my favorite, actually, the one that I use to enable multi-factor authentication are authenticator apps. So the logo on the left there um, is, let me actually point to it, the logo right here that I'm circling is a company called Authy. That's A-U-T-H-Y. You can download an app off of uh, the iPhone app store or off of the Google Play store. Um, and then that is an aggregator of authenticators. Uh, and then the one on the right is an actual authenticator app called, uh, that's Google's authenticator app. Now, the reason I use Authy, so Authy allows me to put my Google authenticator, to put my email authenticator, to put any type of authentication in my app. I can scan um, a barcode uh, or I can put it in uh, by hand. And then I can go to that uh, app on my phone, type in a password, and then I have access to all, I think I have six different authenticators right there. So I only have to go to one place to, to get access to all of my authenticators. 
So it is very convenient for us. Again, uh, that one on the left there is Authy, A-U-T-H-Y. Highly recommend going uh, and getting it. Uh, and the fourth and uh, one that I use today as well is you get an SMS, uh, a text message, or a phone call. I get this from my bank. I get these from uh, Google. I get these from uh, a whole bunch of different places where uh, they'll send you a phone. Uh, they'll send you a phone call if you want, or they'll send you a text message with a code, and then you type that code in. Uh, so that's an example of uh, two-factor authentication. If you have to get access to your phone, not only would you have logged in, you'd have the code and you'd have to open your phone with a fingerprint. So that'd be an example of three-factor authentication. Uh, so adding a, a different level of authentication just increases your security uh, enormously because even if someone gets your username and password, which uh, these days and age, getting someone's username and password, especially if it's not well-designed, is a very easy thing to do. Uh, having multi-factor authentication set up on all of the accounts that matter to you is a great way to, to defend against that because they wouldn't have your phone, they wouldn't have your text message. That, that, that's another level of security that you'd have. Uh, third step, update your software. Uh, I know personally, I am guilty of doing this don't ignore your software security updates. They, they release updates for a reason. We'll get into exactly why, but don't ignore them any longer. Um, they keep you secure, they really do. Um, and you need to make sure that you're updating your operating system and you're also updating uh, any applications that you may have. If either of those is insecure, depending upon the type of insecurity, uh, your computer could be vulnerable to um, getting hacked. So here's how you do this, um, update your operating system on Windows and Mac. On Windows, you click the start button, you go to your settings, uh, which is a little gear in the bottom left side, uh, then you go to update and security, and then you click Windows update. If you have no security updates to show, you'll get a screen and it'll say this right here. You're up to date, last checked 9.29 a.m. today. If you get that screen, you're good. If you have a security update ready to go, highly recommend uh, that you get that updated right when you're off, uh, right when you're done listening to this. Uh, if you're on Mac OS, you click on the Apple menu, which is in the top left side of your screen. You click software update, and if available, you click update now, and that is the screen. You'll see that picture right there. You'll get this button, and you can click update now, uh, and that'll get you updated. Now, let's talk about uh, what is called in the industry uh, end of life um, <coughs> devices. So if you have a device, let's say with Windows 7, um, that Windows 7 has reached end of life. What that means is that Windows is no longer providing regular updates to Windows 7. So if there are any security flaws that are found in Windows 7 from here on out, you will not receive a security patch, which means your device will be insecure. Uh, and this actually, this is how a lot of hackers end up getting into systems, is they will scan networks for devices using um, insecure operating systems, and they will already have uh, what attack, what hack they're gonna, gonna implement once they find those devices ready to roll, uh, because it's uh, well known that these, that these security flaws exist. So the reason uh, that I recommend you update these softwares is these uh, operating system updates come out for two reasons. The first is quality of life improvements. Maybe uh, the buttons click a little quicker, or maybe it looks a little nicer, what have you. But the second reason, and uh, the most important one, is if there is a security flaw in the operating system, Windows will provide updates to patch that security flaw so that it cannot be taken advantage of. So if your operating system, example, Windows 7 uh, or Windows XP, has reached end of life, you are no longer getting security updates, which means you're insecure. Uh, and Apple has the same uh, process where I think it is every device that is six years or older. So I have a, a 2012, I think it is, uh, MacBook Pro, 15 inch MacBook Pro, that has reached end of life in the middle of 2018. So it is now not getting, I don't have, I, I don't know which, what the most up-to-date software for Mac is right now, but I can't get it on that device. So if that's the case for Mac, you have to buy a new device. Uh, if you have a Windows device, depending upon the, um, the hardware you have in your, in your desktop or your laptop, you can update to Windows 10. There are many ways to do that. If you have a question, 
uh, about doing that, my contact information will actually be at the end of this presentation. Um, so if you want to figure out if you can update your Windows device, you can send me an email. We'll get that done with you. Uh, but if you're on Mac, like I said, you're just going to have to buy a new um, Apple device. Uh, so the fourth thing we're going to go over, phishing. So let's give you uh, email phishing specifically. So let's give you a couple stats. 91% of successful data breaches start with a phishing email. Uh, so even if you're really, um, you're really good about getting your security updates in, you're really good about uh, not uh, downloading anything suspicious or anything that raises some red flags, if you click on a phishing email, you get phished. 91% uh, of those breaches start with a phishing email just like that. Additionally, only 11% of organizations continually train their employees to recognize these attacks. So 91% start with a phishing email and only 11% are actively defending against them. Uh, and in 2019 alone, phishing accounted for over 12 billion in losses. Now, as a small or medium sized business, your first thought may be, well, I'm not at risk. Those are just the big guys. That is not the case any longer. Uh, so we have seen an increase in small businesses and individuals becoming targeted with phishing email scams uh, because it is essentially uh, to hackers, it is easier for them uh, to, to target smaller and medium sized businesses because large businesses are starting to put a whole bunch of different defenses in place. Um, so they are, uh, hackers are essentially spreading out their efforts and they are starting to target small and large businesses. Um, I have heard, so I've talked with uh, SBDCs, chambers of commerce, small businesses, large businesses, and asked them a whole bunch of questions about phishing. Every single um, size of organization, every single type of organization um, is now at risk and has had issues with phishing over the last year that I have talked to at least. And so it is a very large issue that we need to be aware of, that we need to be prepared for, uh, and that you need to be preparing your employees for as well. There are four main different types of phishing. Uh, we'll go over uh, vishing, which is voice phishing, and then SMS phishing um, in a second. The one that we just talked about was email phishing. And then social engineering is also a form of phishing. Social engineering has an infinite f um, amount of forms it can take, but it's more often someone impersonates someone else and gains your trust and or gains access to your business uh, and then gets whatever they want. Gave that Maybe they get sensitive information. Maybe they steal money. That is social engineering. So here is how you can defend against a phishing email in five easy steps. You're just going to ask yourself every email you open, you're going to ask five questions and you'll get really good at answering these five questions in a couple of seconds. So it's not going to add any amount of uh, measurable time to your day. Uh, you just need to ask yourself these five questions. And at first it's going to be a chore, but it, uh, what it's going to turn into is something that you'll recognize automatically. Like, Hey, wait a second. This, this email looks a little fishy pun intended. Uh, and then you'll, you'll end up looking at it more carefully. And that's what we want. We want to train you to look at emails more carefully. So the first question you ask yourself, am I expecting this email? So if you receive an email from your boss and it says, I mean, I've actually seen these emails, uh, receive an email from your boss. Hey, we need, I need $400 in prepaid Visa gift cards. Can you go get it? We'll reimburse you later. Uh, that's a, a very popular phishing scam actually. Uh, are you expecting your boss to send you that email? If not, confirm with your boss that they sent that via phone call, via text message, in person, what have you. Um, and um, don't get fished with that type of scam. So you can always just ask yourself, am I expecting this email from this person? That's a great first step. Second question, is this email too good to be true? Nothing in this world is free. Uh, there's always there's almost always a catch, especially if someone sends you an email saying free iPad mini, all you got to do is sign up here today. Um, think about that. Is it, does it feel like that is way too good to be true? And then take a, a more, a, a more in-depth look at the email at that point. So, I mean, Amazon comes out with giveaways all the time. Large companies do these giveaways all the time. So if it's from a reputable, reputable source, if you're able to confirm it is from a reputable organization, that is a different story. But if some random email uh, forwards you a link or sends you an email that promises you something too good to be true, take a, a much harder look at that email and verify its authenticity. Third, does the email domain match the sender? So if you look at who sent you the email, that is called the email domain. That's the domain the email got sent from. 
Uh, and then if you click uh, in, in Office and in Google, there's a little uh, arrow you can click that'll open up some additional information that gets sent along with emails. And you want to check that the domain of the person that sent you that email is the same as the domain for what is called the signer of that email. So there are people who send the email, there is an organization that'll verify the domain um, of the sender that that is also valid. Um, if those two aren't the same domain, it is a very uh, good chance that that is a phishing email. And I would highly recommend uh, taking a better look at it. Or if you don't need anything in that email, definitely uh, just delete that email. Don't even bother with it. The fourth question you can ask yourself, when you hover over a link, where does it go? Uh, so the most common way to fish people in emails is if I send you a link, uh, that says, hey, someone attempted to log into your Gmail account, click here to change your password. Where does that link go? Does it go to google.com? Does it go to uh, reset.google.com? You just need to make sure that that link is going where it says it does. So if it's going to goog.le, that, that's a little fishy. Or if it's going to a random, a lot of them do this, if it's going to a random um, website, that is, that's a phishing email. If Google sends you a, a, uh, an email that says, hey, you need to reset your password, what I, what I would recommend is just going through Google. So log into your Gmail account and reset it through your Gmail account. That is probably the best way to do it. And the fifth, fifth question you can ask yourself, can you confirm the authenticity of this email? What I mean by that, if your boss sent you this email, if your coworker sent you an email that you're worried about, go talk with them in person, give them a phone call send them a text message. Um, a lot of emails you get don't require an, an immediate response. And so you, you, you are afforded the ability to go uh, confirm with that individual that they sent you that email, uh, which uh, that's all you would need is to confirm the authenticity. Um, and that's the, so, so remember those five questions when you're asking yourself a phishing email. If you answer these five questions um, every time, like I said, it'll get, uh, it'll become second nature uh, to you in no time, uh, you are already on your way to not being uh, fished by a uh, phishing email uh, and you are doing great. So with that, let's go over to uh, SMS and voice phishing. So there are four, four rules that uh, we came up with to avoid SMS and voice phishing. The first, don't give out your information. You don't need to. If, uh, for instance, I bank at Wells Fargo. If Wells Fargo calls me and says, hey, I need you to confirm your, uh, your identity, that is a big red flag for me. If Wells Fargo is calling me, they have my cell phone number. They have all of the information they could possibly need on everything about me. I don't need, I shouldn't need to give them anything. I shouldn't need to confirm anything uh, with them. So it's a big red flag if the, the organization calling you asks you to confirm your authenticity. They're calling you. So they know your cell phone number. They know your home phone number. Um, that's, uh, you shouldn't need to confirm anything with them. If anything, they need to confirm with you, so you need to ask them questions. The second, contact only through secure channels. So what I recommend to a lot of people who get these phone calls is if you are worried, uh, and sometimes, um, sometimes these emails um, or these phone calls and text messages are very convincing. If you're worried that they might actually be true, for instance, for me, I would log on to Wells Fargo's website. I would look at the phone number they're asking me to call, and then I would call Wells Fargo. And I would say, hey, I got this text message. I got this email. I got this phone call. And I just want to start. I want to confirm, one, that that is actually happening, that someone tried to steal money from me, let's say. Um, and then, two, I want to remediate that with you. So you can always call them back. Or, or reach back out to them through the secure channels that they recommend on their website. Um, organizations, I have not seen an organization that will try to get you to do otherwise. So if you're saying, you know what, if you're on the phone with these individuals and you're saying, hey, I will call you back from a secure line and they're trying to get you not to do that, it is a big red flag that it is um, someone attempting to steal your information. You will always be pushed by these organizations to contact through secure channels uh, to put your mind at ease and to make sure that it is not a phishing scam. Uh, so always, you always have the right, hang up the phone, call them back on a secure channel. Third, be suspicious. What I mean by this is uh, it doesn't hurt to think that you're um, always getting fished. Um, and the way that I do this personally, the way that I 
uh, confirm that it's not a phishing email, I'll ask them to give me information about myself. So if they know my name is Connor uh, and it's my bank, I'll say, okay, can you confirm how much money right now is in the account with these four digits? If they can't do that, uh, hang up the phone and call back through a secure channel. They have the information they need. Uh, the person calling you uh, should have access to your security question answers. Uh, they're never going to have access to your password, uh, but they should have access to your username, your phone number, your home address, uh, the amounts in your accounts, wh whatever information you're storing with them, they should have access to, and you can ask them to confirm that with you. But the fourth thing that you can, the fourth rule that you can remember, refuse their request. At any point in any conversation that you have over the phone, if that organization or that person asks you, hey, can you give me your login information so I can blank, hang up the phone, that is a scam. No organization will ever ask you for your login information. They don't need it and they don't want it. They don't want to store it. They don't want to know it. You are the only person that has access to your login information and they don't need your login information to help you. If anyone at any point over the phone asks for your login information, hang up the phone, report that number, report that um, email domain, whatever, whoever sent it to you, that is a phishing scan. You don't need to do it. You don't need, you can refuse any request. And like I said, these organizations, their job is to push you towards more secure forms of communication. So if you are suspicious, if they do ask you for the, to do these things, to give you their login information, hang up the phone, contact through a secure channel. That's what I always recommend. If you do these four things, if you remember these four rules, you'll be um, very, very, very hard to actually fish with an SMS or a voice phishing uh, text. So what do these look like in person? An exam, I have an example of SMS phishing over there. There's often little information. It's just enough to pique your curiosity, just enough to make you feel like you need to do something, uh, but um, they're not accurate. There's often an unknown sender as well, so a random phone number will text you. Um, my bank uses the same number to text me. Uh, the login information, uh, the login code that I need, Google sends me through the same number. So you'll often get these text messages from numbers you don't know. And if you look at that email address right there, so let me let me circle that as well. If you look at this, this web address that it's sending you to, that's not an Apple email uh, web address. I know that because the actual web address is id-apple. It's not id. Apple, which is very different. Um, it's id-apple.mobi. If Apple is actually saying your, your ID requires verification, they'll do two things. If they're sending you a text message, it'll have uh, instructions on how to do it through another channel, or they'll have an actual web address that is an actual Apple web address. It's not weird looking like that. So always be aware of the unknown senders and the weird web addresses that'll be in those, um, those text messages. For vishing, never give out your login information. We went, we went through that. Be suspicious and your password does not need to be reset. If you remember those three things, um, so like I said, remember the four rules and we'll go over them. Don't give out your info, contact through secure channels, be suspicious and refuse their request. If these are just three uh, examples of what you can do. So never give out your login information. You're never gonna need to do that and your password does not need to be reset. If it does, you can do that, like I said, through a secure channel. You can call them back, you can go into your email, you can log in with your information separately and privately and reset it as well. So with that, thank you for uh, visiting us today. For everyone uh, watching, uh, thank you for taking your time and watching this. Uh, in response to actual, uh, actually in response to uh, the coronavirus scams that we have seen going on, we are offering free phishing training and specifically uh, COVID-19 related phishing training. So what that means is we'll send you uh, coronavirus emails. And if you click on that, uh, you'll get what's, what's called a learning moment. You'll get immediate training to help you defend against uh, opening phishing scams. Uh, and you can sign up right now for free at uh, www.anchorsecurityteam.com slash free phishing. And like I said earlier, if you have any questions or you'd like uh, any advice on what we talked about today or general cybersecurity um, advice, contact me at that email address right there, connor at anchorsecurityteam.com. Uh, so that, like I said, thank you for attending. Jake, uh, Delaware SBDC, thank you for having me. Uh, and I was uh, glad to be here, glad to help you out.
Yes, thank you, Connor. Um, that was very informative. Uh, we really enjoyed that. Um, so now we're going to pass it over to uh, John Banks. Um, I'm going to unmute him. So, oh, he already muted, unmuted himself. So um, uh, he's going to go through some of the SBA uh, scams that they have seen and how to avoid some of that. So uh, you can take it away, John. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, and thanks uh, again for inviting me to join. Um, so uh, with the COVID-19 coronavirus um, and the events subsequent to that and how it has, uh, with shelter in place um, requirements, uh, many small businesses have been um, seriously harmed by this. And SBA has been instrumental in helping these small businesses recover um, from this crisis uh, through the use of an economic injury disaster loan, which is administered directly by the Small Business Administration, as well as the Paycheck Protection program, which many of you may have heard. Um, $349 billion went into the Paycheck Protect, uh, Protection Program, and you would be amazed at how many cyber security incidents have occurred by bad actors looking to take advantage of, sm of vulnerable small businesses. You're vulnerable at this stage. You are uh, worried about whether or not you're going to be able to recover from the current economic crisis, and you're looking for any forms of help. You know that these programs exist because you hear about them constantly on the news and you want to do everything that you can to take advantage of them. And one of the things that we've seen was many, many bad actors sending out phishing email attempts saying, hey, we want to help you. We want to guide you. Uh, just give us your credit card information uh, and we will expedite this process for you. Well, the first thing I will tell you that with the assistance that SBA is providing either on the Economic Injury Disaster Loan Program or the Paycheck Protection Program, there are no fees whatsoever to the small business concern applying for this assistance. In fact, SBA is paying the banks the fees that they would normally incur for providing this service to you. And um, there are some organizations that are assisting the banks. Some of those organizations are legitimate. Uh, others, you just can't really tell. If it's an organization that you're not familiar with, my best advice, and one of the things that we have been providing to small businesses looking to engage in these particular programs is just go for what you know. Um, if you are applying for the Economic Injury Disaster Loan, again, that program is administered directly from the Small Business Administration. Uh, and if you're not going to a website that says sba.gov, in the uh, in the uh, email box, chances are it's not really a good uh, location. If you are applying for the Paycheck Protection Program, that is administered by your banks. And the best advice I can give you is go directly to the site that you're familiar with to engage that particular program. We've seen instances of phishing attempts where a letter came from the an email came back, a phishing email came directly from the lender. Apparently, it looks, if you look at the email, it's very, very similar to the structure of emails that you would get from your lender provider. However, it was crafted that way, and when you click on the links inside, it takes you to a malicious site. Again, information. Uh, they're asking for is your EIN number, your bank account number, your routing number, your social security numbers, all sensitive information. And if I'm going to provide that information to anybody, I want to be really, really reasonably sure that I'm dealing with a legitimate site. It may take a few extra steps from clicking on that link or, or just going in and typing the bank's website address and then finding that page on the company on the uh, bank lenders website but it's definitely worth the effort i can tell you these bad actors are out there and they're doing a lot of harm um, one of the things that we've witnessed is a company um, that uses sba.com as their email address first of all we are a federal agency and as a federal agency our email address always end with gov as in government sba.gov so if you get an email that says it's coming from or originating or directing you to an SBA.com related address, just know off the top of your head that that is not legitimate. They're not a federal agency. 
it is a company impersonating them. Uh, I will. I did share with uh, the folks that are presenting the SBDC uh, an example of one of the biggest bad actors is a company that uh, identifies themselves as SBALoanProgram.com, and they have been fishing firms all over the country about their assistance. They even represent themselves when you speak to the representatives on the phones. They identify themselves as representatives of SBA and they're asking you to complete a application on their line again, on their website, again, directing you to sbaloanprogram.com as opposed to the government extension. And you're putting in very sensitive information, your name, your social security number, your EIN number, your bank account information, uh, and a lot of other PII, um, you got to be very, very careful. Um, again, if you're working with the federal government, sba.gov is uh, the extension that you want to look for. If you get any communications from SBA, especially if you're applying for the EIDL disaster loan, it will say, it will be coming from the web address, disaster customer service at sba.gov anything else be suspicious of um, and you can reach out to my office uh, to verify the authenticity of any um, emails that you're questioning. Uh, again, my email address is my name, john.banks at sba.gov and I invite you to share that information with me. We want to make sure that you're staying safe. We recognize that small businesses, especially during this period of time, are vulnerable and if you hear some news that may be too good to be true, you want to be tempted to uh, take advantage of that opportunity only because you're in this vulnerable position and we want to make sure that you stay safe through the process. Um, all that being said, I'm going to repeat some of the things that was mentioned a little bit earlier. First and foremost, SBA does not require you to pay anybody to apply for either the EIDL loan program or uh, the Paycheck Protection Program go directly to your lender. They're not going to charge a fee. There may be some fees associated after the loan is approved uh, where you may have to pay a portion of some of the closing costs, but to apply for these programs are absolutely free to you. Um, we would ask, and SBA would never ask you to do, to provide your personal information via email. Um, and if you want to make sure that you're dealing with a person, and we had an instance Yesterday, uh, James Provo, who is one of my colleagues, he happens to be a business owner, but he's also an economic um, development specialist for the SBA. He got a phone call from one of these bad actors. They were asking him for some information and he was playing right along with it. And it was a company that had some sort of SBA.com related address. And after five minutes into the conversation, Jim identified himself as an employee of SBA and they hung up the line. So be very, very careful. If someone is calling you, let's say, for example, you have an application pending at SBA for an economic injury disaster loan, and they're calling you about information, ask them to verify to you your application number. That is a number that is provided to you the moment you submit your application to SBA, and only you and SBA will kind of have the access to that information. So make sure that the you ask to verify that and maybe ask to verify some other pertinent information before you proceed to exchange information over the line. Again, look out for the phishing attempts. Every email that comes from SBA will have an sba.gov um, point in the email address. Uh, again, our information comes from disaster customer service at sba.gov and any email communications from SBA Again, we'll have that information. As, and I want to say the same thing for your banking institution. If you get an email or something relative to your Paycheck Protection Program um, application that you may have pending, you want to verify uh, either through your lender, through your loan officer, through your point of contact at the bank to make sure that that email is legitimate. Stay safe, everyone. Passing the baton back to you. Yep. Thank you very much, uh, John. That's very informative. And uh, uh, we appreciate you taking the time to, to speak with us. Um, so again, thank you very much. And, uh, and your email was john.banks at sba.gov, correct? 
Correct. All right. So those of you who have uh, any requests uh, or specific questions, feel free to email John. Um, he is a pleasure to work with. He answers a lot of our questions here at the SBDC. So uh, it's always been a great uh, time working with him. So without further ado, I thank everyone um, for joining and I thank everyone for uh, just participating. So thanks. <laughs>